is a partner with Weirfolds, which is a legal firm specialized in corporate commercial litigation and estates, trusts, and capacity litigation. Carolyn believes that failing to properly plan your estate before you die can cause a great deal of havoc on your family when that inevitable day comes to pass. The impact of a poorly written will or uh, selecting the wrong ex ex excuse me, executor. That's it. I knew it was going to bungle that um, executor of your will can force your family into litigation in order to sort out your estate, and this is something that's avoidable. Carolyn draws on over 10 years of experience working with business owners, families, and professionals. She's appeared at all levels of courts in Ontario, including the Court of Appeal and Divisional Court, as well as the Federal Court of Canada. She has been an adjunct professor at the University of Western Law School and is a regular speaker on a variety of legal topics. Carolyn is also a contributing author to a loose leaf book regarding electronic documents and e-discovery. Without further ado, Carolyn Abella. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. So, as Jeremy said, I'm going to be talking to you today about how to avoid family litigation after you die. And some of you might be thinking, well, I'm dead, so who cares? But consider this next slide. This is St. Peter at the gates of heaven, checking in all those deceased coming up the steps. And he says to them, ocean view, or would you prefer to watch them fight over the will? So let's hoping that part, part of that is true. So can anybody tell me, what do people fight about? Anybody can just yell it out from the audience? Money. 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 Bingo, number one, money. The other thing that people fight about is what I call emotion. And when I say emotion, I'm talking about perceived wrongs, favoritism, and it's always about the bigger piece of cake that a sibling got on their second birthday. It's always about the history that daddy preferred my sibling over me. And it's also about expectations. So with the increasing amount of wealth being transferred since World War II, children have an expectation of what they will receive. And when they don't get it, then there is litigation. So what can go wrong? When you're talking about a power of attorney, for example, you can have a power of attorney for personal care, or there's a power of attorney for property. And generally speaking, with respect to powers of, power of attorney for personal care, people don't generally fight about who's going to change mommy and daddy's diaper, although I have seen that happen. But really, like you said, the argument is about the money, the power of attorney for property. And because with respect to powers of attorney for property, it's a very, it can be a very broad document, and you're dealing with tangible assets and intangible assets. And a lot of people do not think about powers of attorney to encompass something like um, share structures or, or voting rights for shares. But depending on who drafted, depending on how it's been drafted, it can encompass that. And so there's a lot of room to argue when we're talking about power of attorney. The other thing that can go wrong is with respect to wills. And it could be a matter of a sibling going to um, their own lawyer and bringing mommy and daddy to their lawyer and then having a will change and a gift will change maybe a few months before death. These things do happen, I have seen it. So I just wanna give you a couple of examples that I've seen or one example in particular that I've seen across my desk with respect to capacity litigation. Great story about a, a young man who came to Canada to escape the Holocaust, World War II, ended up building a massive empire, real estate empire, and had a beautiful wife and three beautiful daughters. This might sound familiar a little bit. The first daughter was financially independent, professional. She could make her own and didn't need her parents' money. The second daughter was outside of the jurisdiction uh, of Canada and really had her own life and her own family. And so again, she was sort of out of the box with the family. The third daughter was financially dependent on her parents. And fast forward in time, unfortunately, this strong, stubborn man who created this empire ended up developing dementia and Alzheimer's. 
And unfortunately, his wife couldn't care for him at home anymore, and he ended up having to go into a, in a really nice uh, uh, residence with a full-time caregiver. What was discovered was that um, the daughter, who was financially dependent on the parents, ended up, and we don't know how exactly this happened, but she ended up transferring or causing to be transferred, either through a forged check or we don't know, a million dollars while her father had dementia and Alzheimer's into her own account and to her family's account. And of course, um, pardon the colloquialism, but all hell broke loose. And of course, it became a matter of really an adult custody battle, whereby it was a matter of whether or not the daughter should be visiting the father without supervision, without somebody independent there, because they didn't know what she was capable of doing. So that's an example of litigation where you don't think, you know, you don't think that this could happen to you. So I'm going to tell you some ways on how to avoid litigation. I'm going to tell you about who to hire, communication, executors, and of course, capacity assessments. But before I get into that, I wanted to tell you about, or I wanted to give you context where something that we can all either relate to or something that we all know. And I can't relate to this, but maybe some of you can. I thought Arnold Schwarzenegger was a great example of a family tree. So you have his beautiful wife, Maria. You have their four beautiful children, Catherine, Patrick, Christina, and Christopher. But then, of course, you have Mildred, the housekeeper, which we all discovered last year about. And we know about Joseph now, who is Arnold's illegitimate child, who looks almost exactly like him. So in that uh, context, tip number one, although on the Arnold note, one of my, uh, my thoughts, and I'm hoping you didn't come here to, to listen to this part, but tip number one is don't have sex with your maid and have an illegitimate child. But my tip is hire an expert. That might sound a little bit like a self-serving comment on hire an expert, but you'd be amazed at how many files and cases cross my desk because the family thought, listen, we have an established relationship with our business lawyer. They know the family, they know the family dynamics. It'd be easier if we just gave the file to them. Unfortunately, I have litigated cases where that has happened. And it's all about the uh, lawyer ends up becoming a witness in the matter, and they didn't uh, adhere to the proper procedures on how to not only execute a will, but how to actually carry out the instructions. So you get what you pay for, really uh, has meaning. You might want to spend a couple thousand dollars now to save hundreds of thousands of dollars for your family later. Tip number two, have a family meeting. Now, when I say have a family meeting, I can't stress communication more. Communication, communication. Uh, there could be reasons why you'll have unequal distribution. Like in Jeremy's case, you have his brother, who I think he said ended up pursuing something else. So there would be reasons why you have a family, who, family member who's active in the business, and perhaps another family member decided to pursue academia. So there, there are reasons. You need to sit down with your family members and say, why you're choosing them, who are you choosing, and what you want them to do. Um, and you know, confronting them while you're alive, as opposed to waiting when, when you're gone so that they can argue about it. It's about managing the risks of litigation and mitigating your damages. And as I said, uh, with the Arnold, in Arnold's case, you have the blonde at the door with the postman and the baby looking exactly like it, although when I gave this to my secretary to put on the slide, she didn't understand the slide because she didn't see the familiarity with the, the baby. But don't appoint your mistress as executor of your estate. So for the blonde, in the blonde's case, don't appoint the postman because the husband's going to get mad, and of course, that's sure to, uh, to create rage. So a little bit about exec executors. The role of an executor is extremely important. Um, it is a fiduciary role, and it is, uh, has uh, many obligations uh, attached to it. And I'm sure that if you ask somebody who's been an executor, will you do it again, they will run fr from the building screaming because it is a very onerous job. And more importantly, there's personal liability when you're, when you're an executor, so depending on, on how you carry it out. 
So the question becomes is, who do you choose an as an executor? If you have two children who are like oil and, and vinegar, or oil and water, and they're obviously, they won't get along, perhaps it's not a great idea to make those two executors, or maybe switch it up. Put the professional trustee and to the two siblings, where the professional trustee has a voting, uh, deciding voter a veto right over the two children. Or just make the professional trustee as executor. Just remember that either way, the children who are executors or the professional trustee are by law entitled to compensation. So you're not going to be able to get away from that. Uh, another thing to uh, consider is whether or not you want executor's insurance. Executor's insurance has now come about in the last few years where you can have uh, insurance with respect to negligence issues. So not things that are deliberate and malicious on the part of executor, but negligence. You might want to consider that. I want to talk to you a little bit about beneficiaries. You have to consider, of course, all of your obligations. And when I say all of your obligations, because now there are now, it's very common to have a second marriage, a third marriage, Maybe perhaps a marriage contract is, uh, is a good idea. And of course, you have situations, if you all recall years ago with Anna Nicole Smith, where she, uh, she married uh, the 89-year-old Howard, I forget his last name. But of course, her children, his children were in an uproar because his massive fortune was now going to go to his new wife. And we have sort of a, a Canadian equivalent that's been in the news lately. This is Rod, Senator Rod Zimmer and his 23-year-old old wife. And I'm sure if he has children, they're not going to be too happy about his ongoing obligations to his young beauty. A little, I want to take a moment to talk to you a little bit about contested wills and powers of attorney. And you see in this a little cartoon. I take it this will is contested and brother with the straight hair and brother with the curly hair are going to blow each other's heads off. But before that, to explain what you're supposed to do, um, what really happens in, in will cases? What happens in, in capacity cases? Well, of course, the common thing is attacks on family members, which is, which is uh, very normal. But then there's the allegations of undue influence. So, for example, uh, I brought my mother to see my, to, to convince her that the voting shares of the company need to be transferred to me, even though my sister has been in the family business for years. And that does happen. And of course, there's allegations that can be raised about suspicious circumstances. So, for example, um, whereby if I send my mom to my lawyer, as opposed to an independent person, and I sit with my mother in the meeting with the lawyer, then there might be allegations that my siblings might make that, hmm, there seems to be something a little peculiar there. And lastly, which is very common, that if you have somebody in advanced age or changing their will and prior to their death, that the testator or grantor in the case of power of attorney lacked capacity. And to avoid that, we have tip number five, which is capacity assessments. I'm not suggesting that capacity assessments are good in all cases, but it's up to the lawyer to decide when a capacity assessment is appropriate. And you see in this, in this cartoon, the video will, she says, being of sound mind, you must know I'm leaving you absolutely nothing. And I love this because it's not uncommon for a parent maybe to want to disinherit somebody, but the, the common allegation that you're going to get is, well, she didn't have capacity to do that. She was at advanced age, and she didn't know what she was doing. So a little bit about assessments. When I'm talking about an assessment, I'm not talking about when a lawyer sits down with the client and says, OK, do you know your assets? Who are your family members? I'm talking about when the lawyer recommends that you go to a professional capacity assessor, somebody who's licensed to do that. And really what happens is they do go through the normal questions, but they also go through a mini mental status exam, for example, and they assess your capacity that way. And again, it prevents allegations of, um, it, of invalidity, saying that the person uh, didn't have capacity. Tip number six is consider your assets. As I said to you at the beginning of this uh, presentation, some assets have a very emotional connection. So if you're dealing with a cottage property, for example, the two children who have an emotional connection with the property, think about why you might want to gift it to somebody uh, one child over another, and consider gifting it while you're alive. Another uh, thing that people fight about a lot is family heirlooms. So it's amazing how many people fight over the Royal Dalton figurines that 
if they paid my legal fees, I could probably buy 20 Royal Dalton figurines 20 times over. But instead, they want that particular figurine because it has an emotional attachment. So usually when you see wills, it says, I give the residue of my estate to X. And you have to remember that the executor has an ability to sell all those assets and not give things specifically to the children. So if you want to gift something specifically to your children, you need to say what it is in your will exactly what it is. Or, as I said, gift it while you're alive. Uh, tip number seven, keep your plan up to date. Like I said, life circumstances change and obligations change. In the case of Arnold Schwarzenegger, he has a child now. Uh, in the case of uh, Senator Rod Zimmer, he now has a young lady that he needs to support. So you have to consider what your ongoing obligations are, as well as keep, make sure that you update your insurance uh, designations, your beneficiary designations as well. And tip number eight, my last tip, is keep your documents accessible. So there's nothing worse than everybody in your family knowing that you have a will, but nobody knowing exactly where it is and nobody being able to find it, because then you're sure to get a fight on your hands. And I'm closing with this little cartoon, but all my money is going to charity, not if your family can help it. So now that I've told you my sort of top eight tips that I've gathered from my litigation practice on what you should be doing, it's up to you after this morning to decide what you will do when you get home. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, with regard to the executor's insurance, uh, what about an indemnity clause? I have seen indemnity clauses, um, but it really depends on how much you trust your executor. And it, presumably you trust them implicitly, but I have seen a situation where there has been an indemnity clause, but the executor have, has acted afoul and favored one children over the another, where it hasn't been in his discretion to do so under the will. And the child had a legitimate argument. So I don't know if I would recommend indemnity clauses. I, I think I would go against that. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Does it normally come down to votes as to if two just like two want one thing and one wants the other? It, yes, because it, it, the difficulty is when you have so many executors, it's hard to get a consensus on the issues, depending on whether or not your children get along or whether they have the same sort of train of, train of thought. So I would say that three is actually a good number because then you can have movement on the estate. You can actually have distributions. I recently dealt with an estate that has been going on now for almost 20 years because of insane disagreements and also because the executor wasn't acting in an appropriate manner. So, so it's not one individual vote, it's, it would be the majority vote. Yes. You can, you can do it such that way. It depends how you're drafting your document, right? It depends how, um, how your will is set up. But it's, it's a good thing. I, I, my thought is that it's good to have a, a odd vote if you have that many children and you want your children to all feel that they're a part of your, your estate. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you recommend it being if you have three children for Jesus example or having somebody that's outside the immediate family so that you don't have two children handing up on one on the yeah. Okay? yeah. So um, the question, sorry, I don't know if everybody heard, but the question was is do you recommend having the three children, if you have three children, or another structure. And I think that ideally, I mean, it depends your family dynamics and it depends on your relationship with your children and how they relate to each other. If you think that they're all gonna get along, then that's super. Um, generally speaking, people do have disagreements, just naturally. So I would think that um, I would like to put one, in that situation, you could put one person and then um, maybe a professional trustee, if, depending on the way you sounded it, depending on your fa family dynamics. Any other questions? Great, thank you very much.